I can hear no problems, thumbs up. Yep, that's great. Well, uh, good evening, brothers and sisters, or good morning over here. As we see the sun come up, you'll see the sun go down, whatever the case may be. Um, uh, if you're taking notes, um, my talk today is called uh, Gifts After the Gift, and I hope that becomes self-explanatory as we go along. If you could turn with me to Romans in chapter 9, that's where we're going to eventually get to. And I just want to sort of take off a little bit about uh, my uh, testimony. Um, uh, it was in 1975 when I'd heard um, uh, words which were totally foreign to me. I hadn't, I'd uh, tried to read the Bible, uh, couldn't make head or tail of that. I'd heard of Jesus Christ and uh, I didn't know who he really was. And I'd, um, uh, I'd heard of heaven but didn't know a place like that existed. But on the 14th of March 1976, in a little place north of Adelaide in South Australia, um, I come out of the waters of baptism speaking in tongues as the chorus goes. And, um, and what a moment. Uh, all of a sudden, life began to change. And uh, uh, it was a, a feeling of coming home or a feeling of belonging. And, um, uh, and all of a sudden, uh, I'm rowing in a, in a, in a brand new boat. And I'm going in a completely different direction because of this one experience, the Holy Ghost. And uh, what a wow factor. And uh, it wasn't long before I began to see other people. Revival was really running rife at the time. And there were many other people coming in and going through that same baptism tank. And uh, there were hippies and druggies and, and bikies and surfies and, and all, along with all the average uh, Joe lunchboxes uh, going through that same baptism tank. And they were coming out the other side, and I was involved now in a brand new family. And uh, my uh, our vocabulary began to change, and all of a sudden we were talking about uh, uh, Acts two four when where how where it all began. Acts two thirty eight uh, that uh, salvation bound up in one scripture. Uh, we're talking about Acts ten that marvelous story about Cornelius. Um, Mark 16, we clung to Mark 16 and the signs that were follow believers. Um, Acts 19, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? And what a story that is for today. And John 3, you must be born again. And uh, uh, Romans 6, being buried with him in baptism. These were became uh, our, uh, our new vocabulary. And all of a sudden, we begin to see people uh, coming to the Lord. It was a simple message. And people were coming in in T-shirts and thongs and curtains, and we had our, our long hair. Gee, I would love, I'd love to have some of that today, I can tell you. Um, but uh, it was a simple message, and, uh, and people were responding. And not many people had heard about the Holy Ghost around that time, but today it's still a simple message. But with technology at our fingertip today, mankind seems to have an excuse for everything. They think they know everything. They can just dismiss God and, and, and put him aside. And, uh, so, but the message hasn't changed. And uh, we read here in, in Romans 9 and verse 20, you've turned to it now, where it says, Nay, O man, who art thou that replies against God? Shall a thing form say to him that formed it, Why hast thou made me thus? And mankind seems to have this uh, an answer for everything. And they either know somebody who's been filled with the Holy Spirit or they've received themselves and they just seem to dismiss that and uh, uh, just move God aside. But are we surprised? You know, the Apostle Paul, when he wrote his second letter to Timothy, in chapter 3 and verse 5, you don't need to turn to these, but I'm just going to go through them. We know that talks about the last days where Paul wrote to him and said that there you'd, be, you'd see people having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof. When he, he, took, when he wrote his letter to the Corinthian church, he was hot on about doctrine, the Apostle Paul, and he talked about how God is not the author of confusion but is uh, of peace and sound mind. And it, so Paul was hot on doctrine. When he uh, spoke to the Ephesians in Acts 20, he said, I have not the shun to declare to you all the counsel of God. When he wrote to t uh, Titus in, in chapter 2 and verse 1, he said, but speak the words which become sound doctrine. Paul was hot on sound doctrine, which the church has just 
deny nowadays. And it, uh, how strong is this word that we've got? You know, even uh, King David, back in the Psalms 138, uh, verse 2, where, he, where we find here where God uh, magnified his word above his very name. This book, this very word that sits on our lap, it's on our device, it's in our heart. How important is that word where God would put that word above his very name? You know, um, when I retired, I've been retired for about 11 years now, and uh, and uh, my, my wife, sister Mandy, and I, we uh, we began to travel all over Australia. Well, we went to overseas as well, but we pulled a caravan about 300,000 300, uh, kilometres across the nation now, going from fellowship to fellowship. And, uh, you know, uh, sister Mandy would always give her testimony, always very just for me. And uh, she would always uh, talk about how, uh, wherever we went, that the salvation message in every fellowship we went to was absolutely crystal clear. And hallelujah for that part. She would always talk about how the doctrine was always sound. Very rarely we ever heard something that we, we thought, oh, that's strange. It was sound. And hallelujah for our, our oversight around our fellowships who have kept it together. Do you know, uh, one of the, as you, as you travel, you get involved with different communities and different church groups, talking to them and stuff like that. And one of the most frustrating things that uh, we encountered was um, trying to explain the difference between speaking in tongues, receiving the Holy Ghost and speaking in tongues, and the gift of tongues operated in the church. People just did not get that. Even Pentecostal people did not understand that. To us, brothers and sisters, we get that. We understand that. But wow. And they would just push it aside. They would say there are churches who would tell us that speaking in tongues is of the, of the devil. What an indictment on, on God's word. There are, um, they took, others would tell us how it, it died out with the apostles. Uh, some would say it's mass hysteria. Uh, there are others who say it's for preaching or it's the least of the gifts and so it's not really that necessary. You may have heard those things where you are and uh, I've certainly heard it in my line. And so it became frustrating to talk to and people just turf it aside there. And I just want to actually just spend a little bit of time talking about those two gifts of tongues. And so if you can go with me to Luke 22. We can go to Luke 22. And this is a time when um, Jesus was having a, 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 a conversation with one of the disciples there, Peter, and we find down in, in verse 31 of, uh, of Luke 22 where he says, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for thee that thy, thy faith fail not, and when thou art converted, Strengthen thy brethren. Now, Peter went on to talk about his own virtues and what he would do. But, I mean, Peter could have quite easily have said here, well, who's more converted here than me, Jesus? I mean, I walk with you and uh, I talk with you. I sleep there. I, I eat with you. I'm with you 24-7. Who's more converted here than me? But uh, I don't know whether he said that. I mean, he could have said that. But, you know, uh, Peter didn't know at that point in time that he was going to play or feature in a big role just a little bit down the track there. And because we know that Peter, Peter was there uh, when they were instructed to wait in Jerusalem for the promise to come, which they he, Peter was there for that day. Peter was one of the 120 that were there in the upper room as they were praying and waiting in expectation of this promise that was going to come. And Peter was there when the Holy Ghost descended and sat upon their heads as cloven tongues of fire. And as they received the Holy Ghost, as they began to speak in tongues, as the Spirit gave utterance, Peter was there. And they begin to manifest the joy and the enthusiasm and the excitement of this incredible phenomenon. What? 
a monumental moment that would have been never in the history of mankind or the universe for that matter. And right here in Jerusalem, he's there with about 120 people and now they've just received the Holy Ghost. And the joy and the enthusiasm would have been there. And it must have been an exciting moment as we find in Acts 2.6 where it was noised abroad and all of a sudden people begin to come. And they begin to, to uh, hear this amazing thing that was taking place. And uh, um, all of a sudden, we don't know how big that crowd was, of course, but, um, I mean, we know that 3,000 souls were, uh, about 3,000 souls out of the kingdom that day. But all these people come, and who was there? We don't know who was there. And then all, they were wondering, and they were questioning, and they begin to mock about what was taking place and, and so on. And you must be wondering, what was going through the mind of Peter at that point in time? Did his mind take him back to Luke 22? When he was having that conversation with Jesus, and all of a sudden now, this is Peter's moment. Now he's converted. And it's Peter, the stairs of the 11, and it's Peter who becomes the first evangelist for the new church as he begins to tell them. And he goes through the prophet Joel and he talks about all the history right up to that current moment there. And then as they're listening, somebody, was it one, was it two, was it many? But someone posed the question, well, what do we do? What, what do we do to get a bit of that, what we're just seeing and hearing now? And Peter is the first person who talks about the scripture that we all now talk about in Acts 2.38. Let's read that. We know it so well, but let's just read it in Acts 2.38. When Peter says, I want you to, you need to repent, to turn away from your old way of life to uh, be baptised, I think the word's baptisma, which means to immerse or submerge or to be made fully wet, to bury your old way of life. Every one of you, all of you, this is now for everybody now. Uh, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, your faults and offences, and ye shall receive what? Ye shall receive the gift, the gift of the Holy Ghost. And it's this word we just want to talk about there, and, I, and maybe Pastor Manuel might be able to correct me a little bit with my Greek a little bit later, but from what I understand, this word is, comes from a, a Greek word, adorea, and uh, it uh, talks about it's a gratuity gift. It's a present. It's a sacrifice gift, an offering. It's a, a must gift. You must be born again. So this is, this is our birth gift right here when we receive it. And when we receive this gift, we know it's like a woman giving birth to a baby. When she gives birth to the baby, she knows. It's no different than what Jesus told us in John, 4, John 14, verse 20, where he says, at that day you will know. And uh, that day they knew. So that was the, the receiving of this, this uh, Doraya gift. Once you received that gift, another, another gift or gifts, come automatically inside of us now. And uh, they are the nine gifts. And if we can go to Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 12, 1 Corinthians 12, and uh, Paul talks about these gifts here. Uh, he, he says in verse 4, um, now there are diversities of gifts of the same spirit, the benethma. Uh, this is the, 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 the spirit. And this Greek word for this is charisma. Now, if you look down in verse 8, we won't just, uh, we'll just br brush over the top of them now. In verse 8, we read through, and you probably know them anyway, but this, um, the, these gifts are the word of wisdom, the word of knowledge, faith, healing, working of miracles, prophecy, discerning of spirit, tongues, and the interpretation of tongues. Now, these are completely different gifts. So when you receive the Holy Ghost, the Doraya, these charisma gifts come inside of us now. They begin to dwell inside of us. And this word means, charisma means endowment. 
And I just want to give you a, uh, a natural analogy of what that really means, uh, endowment. To put it in perspective, um, here in Australia, um, in 1941, uh, we had a Prime Minister here, uh, our, our country was run by a Liberal government back in 1941, and uh, we, it was headed up by a Prime Minister by the name of Robert Menzies. Now, Robert Menzies was the longest serving Prime Minister in this country, in Australia. Coincidentally, um, just as a matter of trivia, uh, over the Pacific in your country, the longest serving president uh, was Franklin D. Roosevelt, who was actually in government around the same time, uh, it would appear, and uh, he was the longest serving president in America. And just as a little bit of trivia, I think he was actually, he died in office, someone might be able to text me later on, let me know if that's right, but I think he died in office around about 1963. But he died in a place not far from you guys, I think about two to three hours southwest of where you guys is a place called um, Warm Springs. Can I have that? Is that thumbs up? Is, there, is that true? I think it's about three hours away. And that's where he died. So, that, you know, that's just a bit of trivia. I just thought I'd chuck that in anyway for you. But getting back to getting back to um, um, Robert Menzies. So Robert Menzies headed up the Liberal government here, and at that time they brought into 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 play in Australia a uh, a thing called a Child Endowment Act. And what that really meant was if you, a, uh, a woman who gave birth to a baby, you were entitled to five shillings per week per child. And that would come in a thing called an endowment check once a fortnight. Now, here was the thing. You could only get that check if you had a, um, uh, a surviving child. In other words, no baby no check. So if you didn't have the baby, you couldn't get the check. If we now put that into spiritual terms now, we understand we need a baby. So when we are born again with the Dorea Gid, we become this baby. And then we can have the charisma gifts come with inside of us. So no baby, no endowment check. No Dorea, you can't have charisma. Does that sort of make sense? Can I have a thumbs up if you understand that a little bit? Yeah? You can't have one. So you've got to have the, the birth before you can have these gifts. And so they come inside of us now. Now, in those charisma gifts, we see, as the aforementioned, there was the gift of tongue. And so in other words, you can't have the gift of tongue unless you have received the Holy Spirit. And, they, and the two are completely different. Now, just to get us to understand about those gifts coming inside, they are like an accessory to us. Now, people might think, oh, I don't have the gift of prophecy or I don't have the gift of faith or I don't have... You, all of us have them inside of us. They are now an accessory that God automatically puts us in, it puts us in there to be used at the designated time whenever where we are. To get us to understand that a little bit, I've now become a car salesman. I'm going to sell you a car now. And um, and we're about to sign the paper that car, but I go, well, hang on a second. Before we do that, I'm going to chuck in some accessories for you, some freebies. And I'm going to give to you, for nothing, uh, I'm going to give you a, 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 a tow bar, I'm going to give you a roof rack. I'm going to give you a ball bar and, and, and all these goodies. And you sign that off and you take that vehicle away with those accessories away with you. And they sit with the car. And then one day you're at home and you want to do a little project at home and you need to get, some, say, some timber to do a little project. And so you go down to the hardware store and you go, oh, how am I going to get that long timber in my Oh, I've got my roof rack. Now, you haven't used it before, but now you're using that accessory. Or I want to do a little thing in the garden and I want to get some soil from my backyard. Oh, I can use my tow bar that I've got to tow the trailer to get my soil. So they, 
they are used at a precise time. Just like in the church, when we operate this, the voice gifts, there's a time for that. They sit inside of us, readily available to be used at a designated time. So never think that you haven't got the gift, the charisma gift. You have got that in you to be used at a designated time. So the th as I begin to, uh, I just want to actually go through just a, a little thing here. If, you can t if I can take you to First Timothy in chapter 4, there's two scriptures in First and Second Timothy, but first of all, First Timothy chapter 4, and I just want to read these two scriptures out to you. Um, we read in, in verse 14 of First Timothy 4, where Paul says here to Timothy, neglect not the gift that is in thee, which is given to thee by prophecy with the laying on of hands of the presbytery. Now turn with me, if you wouldn't mind, to 2 Timothy and chapter 1. 2 Timothy and chapter 1. And we're going to read in verse 6. Wherefore I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. So here we have these two things. So these gifts, I used to believe and preached that this was talking about stirring up the Holy Spirit inside of us and neglect, not, not neglecting that, but both these words in Timothy are the word charisma. And what Paul was trying to ex uh, express to Timothy here, these gifts that are inside of us, don't neglect them. They are valuable. They are for the use with inside the church, inside of you for a designated moment. Stir them up. Don't let them lay dormant in you. I have given them their accessories. They are freebies for you at a designated time. Now, the church doesn't get, the churches of this world don't get that. They don't understand the difference between the two. And, uh, but brothers and sisters, how good is it that we uh, have a fellowship an oversight who brings sound doctrine to us. We operated the spiritual gifts just a minute ago. There are so many churches who don't understand that. To give you an example of that, I was talking to a brother who used to be in my fellowship for a long time, and he left the fellowship to go somewhere else. For whatever reason, it doesn't really matter. And one day I was having a conversation with him and he said to me, I'm a little upset because the people that I used to be in that fellowship all that time don't talk to me anymore or they don't see me, come around and see me anymore. And uh, I said to him, look, I want to share a cartoon with you. And the cartoon goes to the, the tune of a guy driving his car and his wife sitting over in the passenger seat other way around for you guys. And uh, anyway, she says to him, sweetheart, do you remember the days when we were going out together and uh, you used to drive with one hand on the wheel and the other arm around me and we were all cuddly and snoogly and we loved each other as we were driving along. Do you remember those days? And he says, yes, I remember those days. And she looks back at him and she says, whatever happened to those days? And he said, well, I haven't moved. And so you've got to understand that he had moved away from our fellowship. And I said to him, can I ask you a question? When was the last time you operated one of the voice gifts? And I knew that he operated it. And he said to me, oh, that would have been when I was back in the revival fellowship. And I said, and the reason for that would be? And he knew. And the reason was because they don't operate the gifts where he went. So he traded in more for less. So it's a sad, sad thing that that would happen. As we look to conclude about this part, there's, um, uh, there's just a fascinating thing about these two words. You know, the word Doraya, the receiving of the Holy Ghost, that birth gift, You'll find that only once 
in the gospel message. This is in John John 4, verse 10. And it talks about, it's there where, where Jesus was talking to the woman of the well. It's the, it's Amer the, Samar the Samaritan woman, with Jesus talking to the well, talking about if you knew the gift of God, you can read that for homework, uh, it's the only time that word is mentioned in the Gospels. And it's all about the living water. There is this, this new gift. That word, God, I hear, you'll see that through, all the way through the book of Acts. You'll see it all the way through uh, Paul's letters to the, uh, uh, the, uh, um, the different churches. The word charisma, on the other hand, you will never see that word in the Greek until after the book of Acts. It's actually in Romans 1. And the, the reason for that, and you may well know as well as I do, but if you go to Paul's letters, they all conclude with amen. It's finished. It's done. That's the end of it. The book of Acts, you may or may not know, does not conclude with the word amen. And the reason for that, Peter, back in the book of Acts 2, gives us a bit of a clue about that, where he, re where he tells us in Acts 2.39 that this promise is unto you and to all your children and that are all that are far off, even as many as our Lord God shall call. We find that the book of Acts is a birth book, the book of actions, the book of actions. It, it's, it's not going to finish until God shuts the door. And so um, the reason you can't have the charisma gift beforehand, you've got to have birth before you have the endowment. So no baby, no check. No Dorea, no Harisma. You've got to have Harisma after the Dorea. Does that all make sense to you a little bit? Can, can I get thumbs up on that, guys? So I can understand. Yeah, that's great. So it's an, um, it's a, it's a, an amazing little part there that these two words are different. And so, you know, I now, when I'm evangelizing, I evangelize a little bit differently than what I did back in the 70s and 80s and stuff like that. And I had a woman uh, in Goulburn, which is the, on the east side of Australia, who I met and we were, we were, uh, I was with a couple other, another brother and sister and we were talking about godly things and she asked us what church we went to and we told her that we went to the Revival Fellowship which was Goulburn there, and uh, she said, I used to be involved with that, but I've now learnt that I, know, uh, I don't need to speak in tongues to be saved. Wow. Wow. So our brother there went through Acts 2, Acts 10, Acts 9, which were all those scriptures, Mark 16, and it went completely over the top of her head, and she said, yeah, I've heard all of that. I said to her, would you mind if I talked about these things with you and go through a little bit of the Greek with that with you. Not that I'm all that good with Greek, but I wanted to go through that with her. And she gave me 10 minutes. Do you know, in the 10 minutes, I've gone through this, and uh, she said, I have never heard that. And with that, um, uh, Sister Gary Hall's, uh, Pastor Gary Hall's wife took her to a meeting along with Bridget Moore, and I took her to a meeting. A little way down the track, I was with a group of guys in the Gold Coast uh, talking with some people, and I think actually Pastor Bob Beverly was there at the time, and um, we were talking about this, and uh, Pastor Bob Beverly said to me, Danny, that wouldn't be uh, Donna Humes by any chance, which is her name. I said, oh, as a matter of fact, it was Bob. And he said, Danny, I'm, pr I'm glad to announce that Donna now sits in the Canberra Fellowship as a part of our fellowship today. I thought, wow. Now, that was a, a moment almost dropping tears over. I was just so excited about that part. She had gone all that distance and didn't know the difference between those two words. So, brothers and sisters, let us be excited that we're in a fellowship that operates the spiritual gifts that understands the difference between dorea 
and a charisma. And Pastor Manuel, maybe you could correct my Greek after if you if you wouldn't mind. So never let us let us, never let us trade in more for less. We have a beautiful thing with us, and may we continue to hold to sound doctrine. It is absolutely vital. We're living in last days, and there are all sorts of things which are coming from us left, right, and centre, but may we hold fast to the doctrine that we have today. May we never lose sight of it. Never, may we never move away from it and trade in more for less. May we always understand you have to have the Dorea before you have the Harisma, and may they always be separate and understood by all of us. And I'll leave it right there. Thank you, Pastor Steve.